Hi, and welcome to this presentation about Qt WebKit, Qt, and Web 2.0. My name is Henry Koch, and I work as a product manager for Qt. I worked with Trolltech for four years, uh, now known as Qt Software with Nokia. So today we'll have a brief overview of uh, WebKit. We'll look at specific features that allow you to use common methodologies of working with web services and Web 2.0. And then we'll end up by looking at some of the future possibilities that WebKit enables. WebKit, as we know, is part of Qt, the cross-platform application development framework that works for Windows, Mac, X11, Embedded Linux, and Windows CE, offering the same functionality across all platforms. WebKit was initially KHTML created in the KDE project by Lars Noll and served as the web browser engine for KDE. Later, Apple adopted this and created WebKit. And WebKit is now a standards compliant web browser engine and is jointly developed by Apple, Nokia, Adobe, and Google as an open project. We added this in Qt uh, 4.4 and we've continued to develop it since. As you see from this uh, illustration, we provide both an API on top of WebKit as well as the back end and sort of the, the parts of WebKit where it needs to reach out to the internet or draw to the screen. So the WebKit API provides you with the functionality in the familiar Qt style API. And basing WebKit on Qt ensures that we're portable across all platforms, even Windows C on embedded Linux because Qt supports these platforms. We also provide bi-directional integration, so from within the web environment you can interact with the native side, and from the native side you can interact with the web content. So we'll go a bit into detail on these features as we go along. From a rough overview, uh, we'll look a bit more into detail on the specific classes. So WebKit contains several classes that abstract the common functionality you often need when you want to work with either web content or web services. So we provide a web view, a web page abstraction, a web frame, networking classes, web settings, history, and so forth. And these kind of give you the breadth you need to work with different web technologies. So let's start looking a bit into the specific features of WebKit. And we'll start by the very, very basics. So, of course, WebKit being a web browser engine gives you the possibility of displaying HTML. So, as you see here, a very simple example is to create a simple web view. You can tell it to show a specific URL, and then you show the window. And this basically shows you a, a web view. You also have some basic functionality for doing browser-like operations for instance, back, forward, and reload. And you can think of the web view as the document view of a web browser. So basically the, the document part of this application window. So now we'll do a quick demo, actually. We'll do a, a simple web browser. Uh, just write it from scratch. And if you want, you can, you can maybe even check how long this takes. So we'll start off by creating a simple simple project. So I have a small shortcut to create a simple main. You'll see here we can go in and have a look at this and you'll see this you'll be familiar with this it's a basic widget class and a basic main that allows you to show it. So within this widget we will create some com components we need. So of course we'll start off by having a web view because we want to show some web content and I also want to give uh, the capability of actually writing some some URLs to to show so we'll add a queue line edit and of course any good user interface has to have a layout so we set a new layout on our view like this and 
once we have our layout, we can simply start adding in these um, components that we have created. And I'll start by adding the line edit because I want that to be on the top. We now have a vertical layout. And then we'll add our web view. Like this. And the, the layout will ensure that this all flows naturally. And we'll start also by showing some content. So we'll ask the web view to load a page and pass in a URL to load. So here we'll simply pass in twitter.com for instance. And now this will show a basic web page. We'll also include some classes, of course. And then when you use WebKit in your project, you of course have to tell Qt that please, please include the appropriate libraries and headers. So we'll add WebKit to Qt here in the configure. Run QMake to generate a make file. And then we build our example. So assuming nothing compiles incorrectly here, being a product manager, this happens a lot. We can then run our small example. We can now have an app, so we open our code.app. And once the library loads, we have a small page, a web view that displays some content. And you see now that Qt has laid out everything according to the, the vertical box, and the user interface flows dynamically. And here you see we have the Twitter page loaded. Of course, at this point, intera interacting with the line edit doesn't do anything. So we'll add some code to actually take whatever we write in there and load it. So we'll add a slot to our code, where we'll actually handle um, the return pressed signal. Now this needs to be connected, so we'll connect the line edit return pressed signal. So we type this out, return pressed, and I want this to be handled by the slot called handle return pressed, like so. And inside return pressed, we tell the web view to load uh, URL that is the line edits text like so. So now we can compile our code again which should set up some additional functionality that when we enter when we hit enter on our line edit it will actually send that to the web view and ask it to load the URL we typed in. So let's give this a little time to load. So now at this point we have a very, very simple but a working web browser. And now we can type in a new URL. So maybe we want to load Nokia.com, for instance. And once we press enter, it goes off and tells the web view to please load this page. Of course, depending on the, the speed of the network, we'll have a new page to show.
and there we have the Nokia web page. So that's a very simple web browser. Now, the next level of writing WebKit applications is being able to expose widgets, for instance. So with WebKit, you can actually place widgets inside the web environment. And you can then use HTML and scripts to actually control parts of the infrastructure for your application. Now, there's two approaches to this. Either you can host an actual UI control inside the web environment, or you can expose an object to the script environment, so basically a non-visible object. You can also call scripts from the native side, so web page allows you to evaluate JavaScript. Now, the question is, why would you want to do this? But since you can actually blend in your own custom components inside the web view, and load the web environment from, for instance, a server, you actually can do simple updates by simply changing your HTML file on the server. And when you rerun the application, the changes have taken effect. So this means you can also reuse web design and provide look and feel and use resources that actually can create beautiful web designs, but with actually full native functionality. Of course, you can also interact a lot easier with web services, and we'll cover this uh, a bit later. But let's go into a bit uh, detail on how you expose widgets. Web page or Q web page has a virtual function called create plugin. We also have a plugin factory, but basically, if you use the type application execute plugin, this will be passed to the web view, uh, sorry, to the web page and allow you as the developer to control what you actually show inside the HTML. So inside your create plugin, you return your own widget, as you see here at the lower end of uh, our code example, we return our nice widget. So we'll, we'll do a quick extension of our demo and create some objects that we can show in the web environment and make them work together and, and play a bit with it. So we'll take our existing example and just build upon it. So here we have now a web view. We can extend that by saying, I want to specialize how I display web pages. So I can create my own Q web page. So here we just write this from the bottom a page that extends Q web page. So we need to write the basic skeleton of our class and pass in the various arguments here, our constructor. Now the special thing about web page is the method we mentioned called create plugin. And this is really where sort of the, the capabilities of, uh, of uh, displaying your own content inside the web is. So we can now have a look at the signature for Q web page. And see what do we need to pass in for arguments. And here we can simply just, let's just reuse these to save some typing time. And we'll add that here. So now we have our small create plugin call. And normally what we do is to look at the class ID to see what does the web page want me to create. So we'll simply compare and see if my class ID is, for instance, push button. Then I want to create a new Q push button or if the class ID is line edit, I want to create a new Q line edit. So here we have sort of the, the basic setup of what kind of features I want to enable in the web page. Another thing that needs to be done to actually enable using plugins and uh, it's 
a security feature basically. You have to enable plugins in the web page, actually in the web settings, to be able to load these, uh, these plugins and actually expose functionality. So then we'll access our settings and set the attribute which is Q Web Settings Plugins Enabled. We'll set that to true. So now plugins should be enabled for my web page. We also want to enable JavaScript. So we need to do the same thing for JavaScript and say JavaScript Enabled, like so. Now, of course, we want to have a web page. So we'll write a very simple web page and create some components here. And as you remember, we use the object tag. And the type is an execute plugin. And then we say class ID. So I want to start with a line edit. And I'll reference it line edit as well. So I can grab it later. And we also want to have a button. So I'll do the same again and create a push button. And reference that push button. Now we need to load our web page. So instead of loading our URL here, we'll use a local file. So being a product manager, I don't remember the entire API. So we'll just look into the documentation. And here you see that Qt is actually very nice since you get the whole Since you get the whole API, you can actually just go in and look at everything. And of course, we have very nice documentation, but being able to look into the source code is invaluable. So we'll say that we want to load the test.html file. And now we've enabled some features. We have exposed some objects. And if all goes well, this should be visible in the web view that we load. So let's rebuild. Compile our small application. And of course, there's some uh, things we need to consider. We need to have the correct return type here. And if none of these hit, we just return zero. We also need to have the correct JavaScript enabled. Which is with a lowercase s. So we'll change that. Now let's rebuild. So now when we load this, we will have a web view that loads my small local file and when you when you when you experience that you're not able to load a plugin a nice trick is to go in and add for instance here we can say can't load line edit and can't load plugin Sorry, button, which will actually tell the user that something something's amiss. So the key point about subclassing a new page, you actually have to tell the web view that yes, I want to use the page. So in our code, in addition to loading. Uh, 
new URL, we actually have to say web view set web page and I have to pass in my subclass. So we pass in new page and now the, the changes we've done should take effect. Now let's try to rebuild. Do some small fixes here. Maybe we can actually verify that it's set web page. But it's a page. Okay. So let's change that as well. Set page and then rebuild. So now the web view should actually use my version of a web page to load the contents. And then the create plugin method will be invoked and we can then return a button or a line edit depending on which object or class ID that's passed in by the web environment. And apparently this does not load. So we can try an alternative approach and use my local Apache server to make sure that we actually use the correct one. And there you see, we have now a line edit and a button. Now what happens here is, we're placing these inside a web environment, so we don't get the benefit of the cute layout system. But we enabled development features, or we need to enable development features, so we can show you some additional things here, because widgets that are exposed actually expose every meta object property. So if we go in here and add another parameter which is called developer extras enabled. So we'll just change this and say developer extras enabled and just verify so we save some time and compiling something wrong. This will actually turn on a built-in feature of WebKit which is a development console. So by right-clicking you'll actually have a new context entry. So when we load our test HTML and right-click we can choose inspect and inspect gives you an overview of all of the, the document object model of your or web environment, but also gives you a console for the JavaScript interpreter. So by raising this console here, I should get the JavaScript. feature here might be that we have to actually put in some script code. So we'll add that or rather reuse an existing part. Which should be faster and show you how you can actually play around with some content. Now with inspect we should have a JavaScript console that we can work with. So here we have similar names. So we have a text edit and a button. So here we could say that the text edit text should be 
hello. So I'll move this to the side. And actually it's called line edit. And there you see we actually are changing the contents of the web environment in runtime. We can also say that the push button text should be high there. And you see it changes the actual contents here. We can also create uh, slots and signals. We can actually use that inside the web environment. So here we can create a function first. So we define a function test that takes, that sets the contents or the text of the button to the contents of the line edit. So we can say push button text equals line edit text and then we can set up a connection so we can say push button clicked which is the signal and connect that to the method we just created which is called test and now when we click the button we get the text from the text that it displayed onto the button and if I change the text here hi from line edit you'll see when we actually click the button, we set the text. Okay, so then we've shown some of the capabilities and uh, features of, of WebKit from a developer perspective. Now you can also do a lot of things to interact with web services and WebKit provides the, the functionality to use common methodologies of talking with web services. So you can either use the network library to actually directly access network resources. You can also expose your own widget to HTML and uh, even the object to JavaScript and actually expose business logic from your, from your application to the web environment. And finally you can also call JavaScript from C++. So let's go into a bit more detail here. For the network access we have an API called Q Network Access Manager. This is an asynchronous API that allows you to send and receive data and uh, gives you a very nice API for things like put, post, and so forth. Things you normally do when you're talking with a web server. You can also modify the things you want to send and inspect the results you get back. So looking at the code here, the network access manager will emit a signal called finished. And this signal you can connect to your own slot called, for instance, reply finished, that will also pass along the network reply. So you can create your own special request, ask the manager to, to send a GET request, and then on the receiving end, you can inspect the contents, do some checks that it meets some conditions, and then you can read in the data that's passed along with the re reply. You can also add objects to the frame by calling add to JavaScript window object. This basically allows you to take an object that you have in C++ code and expose it under a name. All objects that are exposed can be read, you can read the properties, you can change the properties. You can also call slots and you can set up signals and slot connections like we saw in the previous example. So the API for this is uh, add to JavaScript window object. It's a method of the Q web frame. On the web environment side, as we showed, you can define a function and set up a connection from a signal emission to actually invoke uh, that function. You can also evaluate JavaScript from the native side. Uh, the web frame has an API called evaluate JavaScript that returns a variant, so you can actually call JavaScript code and get the result straight back in as a variant in your C++ code. Okay, so we'll do an extension of our example uh, where we'll add some login capabilities. We'll actually use the Network Access Manager and expose this to JavaScript and also try to call JavaScript from C++ in a separate example to interact with an AJAX component. So let's go back into our code and create 
a new class here that I'll call Twitter because I'm now going to use the Twitter page we saw before a bit more extensively. And we'll base this off the Q Network Access Manager. Do the basic skeleton setup of our class. Pass in our parent to the base class. And there we have our constructor. But I'll create a new method which should be a slot, slot called authenticate. And what I'll do here is actually to create um, an authentication request. So we'll create an Q network request. And we need to send this to a special URL called twitter.com sessions new and to be able to use basic authentication we simply modify the header so first we create a byte array that has our um, encoding of uh, the username and password so we'll call basic and add a cube byte array encoding of username and password and call to base64 because that has to be base64 encoded and then we can set the raw header on the request so we can pass request set raw header authentication and say that I want to use that base64 string this method has to be posted and since I am now a network access manager. I can just call post and pass in the request and also the authentication payload, if you will. So I also want to call this when I construct the class so I know it's actually invoked. And I want to say here that the web page should use my Twitter class as the network access manager. So we call set network access manager and create a new Twitter that we have on top here. So now when I'm actually setting the network access manager, the Twitter class is created and the constructor we call authenticate, create a request to log into a new session create our authentication payload and pass it, actually post it to the web page. So we'll load a different URL now. We'll actually load Twitter instead. And we'll go into the user we're having for this test. And we can also drop our line edit because I don't want to enable the user to actually move around here and comment out some other things here. Of course, since I'm using the network classes, we need to include them. And we'll actually just include the whole module. Cute network. We'll also modify our profile to add network. And since I've modified the profile, we will run QMake to have a new make file. And then we can build our new application. As always, there are some compilers that we need to fix. One more, and then we hopefully should be good to go. And we're posting our requests to the payload. So this should be all good now. 
And let's see what happens when we load. So let's try one more time to create a correct network request. We have to put in a QURL. It's also important. So once more, we ha now have an application. That hopefully should pop up soon. It takes a little time to load the debug libraries. But here you see we've removed the line edits and the capability of actually changing the location, so we're locking the user now into just one page. So let's give this a little bit of time to load the web page. And there it came up. Let's close this one. So now we have the Twitter web page. The first time we loaded this, we see that already we're logged in. And we see all of our features. Actually, the first time it's not logged in. If we reload the page, the network access manager should have gone to the server, authenticated, and got the results back. Now actually this is not logged in. So let's see if we can figure out what's missing. And we're calling authenticate. And we're setting a raw header called authentication. Now I can maybe cheat a bit and see what the correct one is. and it's called authorization. So it's important to have everything right. So let's go back, put in the correct word, rebuild my application, and let's launch it again, and give it some time to actually load the debug libraries and uh, go out on the internet and fetch some content. Now the first time it'll show us the non-authenticated page, but in the meantime it's gone to the server authenticated and once we reload the server now has the cookie set and we're, we're good to go to actually see the, the settings uh, page and everything. Let's reload the page and you see we now have the option to log in but behind the scenes we should have already been logged in. So the next time we reload we now see we get our profile page and different settings. Okay so the next demo I'll show you is a small component that uses these approaches to actually communicate with Google Maps. And this is a simple class that's based off of WebView. It gives you the option to geocode an address and then load coordinates on the page. So geocoding returns back a set of coordinates and we can actually fix markers for the address. So what we use is a network access manager to, to send a request to the server and then a list of coordinates that should be displayed. So now we'll reuse an example that we have ready made because this is a little bit more work. 
and we'll look at the code for this. So in my main, I simply create the basic user interface. Here we have uh, line edit and our map component. The line edit allows us to write an address and the map component's job is to display this. So we have done the same approach here that we can handle the enter and, and pass this to the map. In the map, we simply called, called geocode. And now let's look at our class that does this. So the geocode, as you see here, has a URL for Google Maps. We can add a query item for the address we're inputting, the output format, and a Google Maps key. And then we send this to the Network Access Manager that goes ahead and posts the result. In our slot for handling the reply, we actually construct, first we interpret the coordinates, and with the coordinates we can construct JavaScript that we actually send to WebKit here. We call evaluate JavaScript after constructing the code. And now let's see how this works in practice. So we'll launch the application. And this just uses a, a pre-made UI here. And again, the debug libraries takes a little bit of time to load here. But now we can type in Oslo, Norway. And when we hit enter, it'll go to Google and actually geocode the results. So we get a marker for Oslo. Similarly, we can do Munich, Germany, and the marker moves. So to walk you through the code, again, we are creating a URL and we can then add query items that will be properly encoded behind the URL. And then we pass this to the Network Access Manager. And on the receiving end, we handle the reply by parsing out the coordinates, creating JavaScript code that we can send and invoke to the QWeb frame. So all of these things give you a new feature, call it that, where you can mix HTML, JavaScript, you can expose your widgets and plugins to create a rich user interface. And what this enables for you is a simple redeployment of the user interface and also the functionality that can actually be JavaScript. E even though you actually have the core of the functionality inside your objects, you can set up the infrastructure in JavaScript. So let's do a last demo here uh, where we tie these things together. So I have the fourth demo here that uses Twitter and let's look a bit at the source code. We do the same things. We, we actually use uh, the same approaches to authentication. So we do the same here. We do authorization, create a new session and then log in. But the different approach here is instead of showing web content we ask for an XML document and once we've received the XML document we use a XSLT file and Qt XML patterns in 4.5 has the ability of using XSLT so let's look a bit at the XSLT file as you see here it's actually HTML. So we say that we want to present our XML as HTML. You could present it as any number of different formats, but you are in control because you have the XSLT file. And here we can put in our custom component and we can present the data in a table. So let's look a bit at how this works. So this application will now go out to twitter.com, authenticate, and give us the possibility of seeing our own status updates and also posting updates. And here we have 
the presentation. This is basically an XML file that we are interpreting using XSLT. We're presenting the data in a table here, but we've also decorated it with a custom object that is really a queue, a queue line edit. We also have JavaScript code that handles return pressed and actually sends an update to Twitter if I enter something new. So we can enter, this is a nice demo. This will then be passed to Twitter through the network access manager and we'll get a reply back with new XML that has the updated contents. So once I hit enter, we go out to Twitter and get back the updated status from the server. So let's talk a little bit about the future possibilities of Qt WebKit and uh, the collection of uh, features that we've looked at. So to summarize, WebKit gives you a full Ajax capability in the web view. You can actually show a full Ajax application and interact with it. You can also expose your own custom GUI components. You can expose objects and you can also interact with them from JavaScript. So imagine someday being able to have the whole Qt API in JavaScript and being able to load UI files from the client. This would give you a very small deployment. You could uh, provide the full user interface and the functionality in say four kilobytes and give you the full rich functionality that you would need. So I'll uh, show you an interesting project that is on labs called uh, the Qt script generator. This example uh, uses the plugin factory of WebKit to parse a new type called Xqt form. And in, inside this, we pass in a UI file and a JavaScript file. So let's launch this example. Basically, Qt bindings and then launch a JavaScript file. So we'll see a page come up. This is actually a WebKit page showing HTML and a custom component. But the custom component is interactable, so we can do some calculator operations here. And it works like a full rich client in the sense that we provide native controls here. So that is my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoy WebKit.